uh, I would uh, first just like to thank the uh, people who have organized this conference. It's been uh, a joy to be here. The food is wonderful and everything has run seamlessly. So thank you so much. Also, the scientific committee for uh, offering very uh, thoughtful and helpful comments on the, our abstract. It, this is still a work in progress, so this is very nice. Um, so to give you a bit of background, uh, we've heard already, uh, particularly in uh, Herb's talk, uh, about this notion of uh, a contrast between effort and uh, expressiveness, let's say. So speakers are uh, lazy, they don't want to do too much, but they also have this intense desire to be understood. Uh, this is from here. <laughs> um, so, uh, this means that we sort of walk a tightrope, we are compromising between uh, making ourselves understood and also trying to be as lazy as possible uh, while doing so, and uh, usually we talk about this as some sort of trade-off. Uh, so in today's talk, which focuses on the relationship between distributional syntactic information, type of lexical items on the one hand, and the acoustic properties on the other, we'll turn to a specific theory, uh, uh, or hypothesis, let's say, uh, the smooth signal redundancy hypothesis, which has been proposed by Alice Turk. This is not, by the way, the only thing that uh, ties into this kind of theory, but uh, it is the one which makes the, mo the most crisp uh, correlations between uh, acoustic <coughs> properties and things that might come from the lexicon or from syntax, so that's why we settle on it. And so what this hypothesis says is that there's some sort of trade-off in what she terms redundancy. We'll return to this uh, term in a moment, and how... Uh, how to interpret it, but uh, basically uh, redundant acoustic properties are balanced against redundant lexical or syntactic properties such that if you have something that is uh, lexically or syntactically for whatever reason redundant, then you get a heavier acoustic signature in terms of prominence. So you can think of redundancy in the acoustic sense here as prominence. Uh, on the other side, lexical, uh, lexical or syntactic redundancy, it's a lot more difficult to figure out exactly what redundancy means. So, um, But, nevertheless, she has given some, some ideas, and I will interject my own, but if we're talking about redundancy, what are the exact properties we mean? On the acoustic side, we're talking about vowel quality, so whether a vowel is fully realized or reduced. Uh, we saw again in uh, Herb's talk something like the the versus the. This is a type, uh, type of thing we're seeing uh, here with vowel quality. Uh, also, just do you have a long O or a short O in two, for example, in English. Um, there's also f zeros pitch, and not just the, the the pitch itself, but also pitch excursions within words. This can be an acoustic signature of redundancy. Spectral balance, which has to do with uh, the form and frequencies being aligned, basically. There's also excursions in this space. And uh, duration, which is what I will focus on here. So duration is the main thing I'll talk about. That's why I talk about, from here on out, prosody and not acoustics. Yeah? Uh, in the syntactic domain, the primary uh, uh, um, operationalization of redundancy has been the sort of in-situ uh, structural expectations. And to give you an example, if I say the orangutan leaped, uh, this is more redundant in the sense that leap is typically used in an intransitive frame. We expect it to be used so intransitively. And uh, we kind of expect the uh, the constituent to end there, so we say, okay, leap is expected in some sense, and hence redundant to occur in this syntactic frame. And a less redundant version would be if we <coughs> attach to that the sort of baggage of the way construction. So the orangutan leaped her way through the trees. This is a... Shut up. Yeah. This is a less expected. And because of that, at the point of transition, we expect longer durations, actually, here uh, in speech. So uh, somebody, because this is less expected, 
the speaker themselves will have some sort of difficulty and they will balance that redundancy out by uh, having low redundancy at the her point and then giving some longer duration, uh, which is prosodically redundant. On the lexical level, we have uh, some things, word frequency, uh, so a highly frequent word is redundant, phonological composition, so a word that follows quite closely the expected phonotactic constraints of a language is going to be redundant in this sense. And then distributional information, and, and this is actually our contribution and what I will focus on today. So the two most critical points are distributional information and their relationship with duration. Uh, just to give you an example of the other two uh, variables that have been studied, uh, we have a word like coat. Uh, it's more redundant because it's a well-formed syllable, it's monosyllabic, it's uh, monomorphemic even. And then we have a word like gobbledygook. It has very many uh, unusual transitions uh, between uh, segments and it is uh, uh, long, it has, it, it's monomorphemic, but has many syllables. These, these are unusual properties for English words. And so again, we expect longer duration, even controlling for uh, the phonological length and all of that sort of stuff. So this word is unusual, uh, and so it, it's a longer duration. So a point on the terminology, as I mentioned before, I'd rather talk about effort than I would about redundancy, because redundancy is a, a difficult term to apply universally, but I think effort is something we can all sort of grasp quite easily. And in fact, when we talk about effort, we see a, actually alignment and not a trade-off. So um, what is more effort, effortful to process lexicosyntactically, for example, for whatever reason, phonological or so on, is something that uh, is performed with more effortful articulation, meaning longer duration. So the effort uh, that it takes to process something shows up in the signature of speech as longer durations. So if we have effort rather than redundancy, there's no trade-off any longer. It's actually the levels are all aligned and we can perhaps move from this kind of definition into a better picture of what's happening cognitively. Uh, so why do I focus on these distributional properties. Well, there was a study by this really bright guy uh, down here uh, in 2018 uh, looking at uh, some effects on production of nouns. Uh, this brilliant fellow looked at something called syntactic diversity. Uh, you can call it how syntactically promiscuous a noun is, whatever that means. Uh, I'll show you. Uh, so. It, maybe you can shout out, is the left one more diverse or the right one? Okay, yes. They have the same number of triangles, same number of colors, yes? But this one is, there's more individuals from each type, yeah? And they're equally distributed. So this is what we would call like a high entropy condition. So we're measuring this, but with respect to the relationship between words and syntactic structures, and I'll get in more detail in a second about what that means. In terms of syntactic typicality, what we mean is how similar a single word is to the behavior of all other words in this space. So again, we can look at these two. Are they similar? Not very much, right? But let's say we have these two. They are similar, yeah? But they're not uh, diverse, either of them. So you can have typical distributions that are not diverse, or vice versa. So these are independent uh, measures. Now, what we found, both syntactically diverse and typical nouns are produced with longer durations when other factors are held constant. So if you act like uh, other nouns, then you are uh, longer. If you uh, are yourself quite diverse, you are longer, and these are statistically independent effects. Uh, so from this we can conclude, if we trust uh, this SSRH, I don't know why it keeps intruding. Turn, turn off your Wi-Fi. Uh, 
I, I have no time for this, so uh, I, I will keep closing it. Uh, but uh, the main uh, conclusion is that diversity and typicality should be then considered effortful. That's one thing to think. Now, this pattern raises a question, namely, what uh, about prosodic effort that is tied to prosodic frames and are actually independent of lexical items, which is the actually the, the primary intuition of uh, people that study prosody. This is a, a thing that gets laid on top of uh, lexical items, irrespective of actually the quality of these items themselves. Particularly, I'm thinking about phrase initial and phrase final lengthening, where phrase here means prosodic phrase, prosodic unit of some kind. And if we have multiple sources, do they attract or repel each other? So is the prosodic uh, lengthening that might be associated uh, with the lexical item itself going to cause it to uh, uh, want to be in a frame-based position that says this is for prosodic prominence, or might they uh, repel each other such that you get uh, words that are not going to be for lexical reasons uh, prosodically lengthened in a position that would already expect that. Uh, and we'll look at this from a global and local position. You'll see what this means in a second. Now, why should we care? Uh, theories actually differ on the autonomy of prosodic syntactic and lexical structure. Uh, so these relationships are not non-trivial. I mean, people argue about these, uh, saying that they either exist or do not exist, or if they exist, in different ways. And uh, some uh, of these theories actually explicitly block uh, tight relationships between lexical items and prosody, in particular uh, at the global scale of the prosodic phrase. And so evidence of an interaction between all of these levels uh, would suggest a non-independence and also that there's no simple mapping procedure which has been mm, proposed by some. Now, our research questions. The first question, we first need to show that in our data we have some uh, structurally uh, specific uh, prosodic effects, so length in particular places. So can we replicate phrase initial and phrase final lengthening? And we predict, yes, we can. Uh, to explore the global interactions, we ask, uh, does this lexicosyntactic effort, I mean the prosodic factors that are tied to the distributional qualities of the lexical items interact with these sort of uh, broader structural features of the prosodic phrase. And yes, we say the ones that we've shown are more effortful in prior research should uh, actually avoid these positions that is to avoid doubling down on prosodic effort. So it, it would be the case that you have two ways of expressing prosodic redundancy overlapping with each other. And you don't want this, because it actually loses all of the explanatory power that uh, doing it in the first place gives you on the lexical grounds. So third question, we look inside. I might skip this one for time, but it's interesting nonetheless. So we look in each of these positions, right, which may be more or less prosodically prominent. And we see do these effects that we have observed across the board in a prior study actually um, modulate uh, prosodic, uh, uh, mo modulate duration within each of these positions equally? Because they may not. And if they don't, then we have a nice cap to the story about why, for example, these forms might not want to be in. Uh, prosodically prominent positions when they themselves, for lexical reasons, are prosodically prominent. So, how do we measure it? We use dependency graph formalisms. So, uh, what you need to know is, uh, you may be more familiar with phrase structure grammar. Here, in the case of dependency grammar, we're talking about uh, a, a directed acyclic graph there are nodes, like you're used to. In this case, however, there are words. The edges that connect the words are themselves typed functional relationships. Uh, and we can uh, retrieve uh, the counts of how often a particular target noun, for example, 
die. Uh, how, how often a particular target num is going to uh, show up with each of these uh, potential relationships attached to it. So that's our space that we're operating in. Uh, I'll skip this. How do we do this? We take the British National Corpus, we parse it for dependencies, we wind up with a bunch of trees, and for these trees, we compute frequency vectors for nouns. So in this made up case, cat and dog show up a certain number of times related uh, to other words by one of these uh, different syntactic relationships. And for diversity, uh, we take entropy with some special adjustments, whatever, we can talk about that later if you like. Uh, we take the entropy of this, so the uncertainty of this distribution as the entropy measure. And for the typicality, we sum all of these up to get a picture of you know, what has been burnt into the system. And then we compare pairwise uh, each individual vector to the sum vector. And so how noun-like is it? What is it a good noun? Basically in terms of its distribution. Uh, so our data come from the Santa Barbara Corpus. It's about 200,000 words. Uh, it's hand segmented into prosodic units and force aligned uh, to a phonetic transliteration. So basically, we take the signal and uh, phonetic transcription. We toss it into a machine learning algorithm. It spits out a beautiful text grid with all the timing data we want. So how long each word, when a word starts, when it ends, how long it is, and so on. And we extract uh, sorry, uh, the, all the instances of uh, that plus noun structure where it's either A or B, so the indefinite or definite article. This is just a control for uh, syntactic and syntagmatic features of the data. Uh, we only get ones that have reliable uh, uh, numbers in our corpus from which we estimate our uh, diversity measures and so on, and only if they occur in all the positions. So we're only comparing nouns that, in this frame, can actually occur in each of the possible places. And then we have lots of <laughs> controls. So we, we looked at a lot of things. Uh, here's the representation of the descriptive representation of the data. So we have uh, types are, are relatively similar across initial, medial, and final position. But you can see here that nouns of this particular structure don't like initial position. I only mention this because it can affect the power of the statistical analysis, but this should be, from people familiar with this course studies, uh, entirely predictable, uh, because this is an end weight effect, basically. Now, uh, the measures uh, that we want to look at are intercorrelated, so we have some components. I, I only mention this because I'm not going to be showing you these uh, the, the, if you know what entropy looks like or so on. This is not that. It's a component that I've extracted from a multivariate space. But luckily, there's one that is, is specific to diversity and one that is specific to typicality. Now, do we find lengthening at the end? Yes. So you see initial, medial, final position. And you see here, length and duration in seconds. And yes, final position is longer. So in our sample, it's good. Uh, in our uh, second model, where we look at prosodic position, we actually do three comparisons. We control for uh, the p-values and all of that. But what we find is that increasing diversity makes the word go further back in the prosodic phrase. So it goes from uh, medial to initial position, it goes from final to medial position, and it goes from initial to final position. So basically, words that are uh, syntactically diverse hate final position. And remember, these are words that themselves have long durations. And they don't want to go in the place where the long duration is for structural reasons. Uh, now, the third model I will cut, uh, and we can talk about it later, but I'll skip to the overall conclusions. So, uh, 
keep coming up. So uh, basically, what I've told you, aggregate lexicosyntactic distributions, things that are not tied to the immediate context, and indeed we do control for that in all of these models, uh, influence production in situ, meaning the aggregate behavior influences what happens uh, in when it's even put in a specific syntactic frame. Uh, this effort deal aligns between the lexicosyntactic properties and prosodic prominence on the local scale, you didn't see this, but it, it's true. Uh, however, structurally driven prosodic uh, effort, uh, the stuff that's tied to the overall frame, repels lexically driven prosodic effort. So the things that are long for lexical reasons don't want to be in the position that the prosodic frame says should be long. And the lexical syntactic effects do not appear in structurally prosodic positions. Again, something you haven't heard. Take my word for it, or we can talk about it later. Thank you very much.